dealer to an international superstar. It's a story of an artist who, through his art, shared his life with the world. It's the story of a life that ended too soon. Biggie, a life story. One, two. Check me out right here, yo. We was like on our way to the park a lot, like waiting for the cars to come out. Our car came first, and we was waiting for Puffy car to come. So when this car came, we all pulled out. Big was in the front, C's was sitting behind Big, and I was like sitting behind the drop. Car just rolled up on the right hand side and just started shooting holes in the door. Everybody heard shots. Everybody just got down in the car. We all jumped out the truck. The only one door ain't open was Big door on his side. He just was looking. And he didn't say nothing. Just like looking, like his eyes was like rolling in the back of his head. We just jumped back in the car and we just took him to the hospital. And we were just sitting there and we. Just... So I keep, you know, holding each other and praying and just said, no, it can't be, you know, until the doctor came in and told us. Because this is all on the floor. Then we had to call his mother, you know. They passed the phone to Puff, Puff passed it to Mark, Mark passed it to me. It was 4.30, Sunday morning. The friend was crying. And all the friend was saying, Miss Wallace, Miss Wallace. He was born in Brooklyn, the most sweetest, the most cuddlest little thing you have ever um, could behold. I mean, you hear so many saying that, oh, he's a child that only a mother could love. But no, everybody loved him. He loved for me to read to him. His favorite story was Winnie the Pooh stories. His nickname, and I haven't told it to anyone, was Chrissy Pooh. He was just funny. He was cool. Just like the average kid, though, just wanting things, you know? Very good student, uh, and I have the awards to prove it. You can imitate people. You might not know, but my boy could dance. He was the cutest little thing, warm, loving, and he brought that love through all his life. When we was from Brooklyn, it's just, it's the hood, you know, it's the ghetto, man. It's just, everybody got a hard living where we at. Ain't nobody living easy out there. Brooklyn is just the land of the lost, man. You just stuck. You have hustling number runners. You know, the corner store bodegas. It's like liquor stores, laundromats, Chinese restaurants. You know, everywhere. This was his little play area from that tree down there to the corner there. His mother was a hardworking single parent. His mother was working and going to school, and he basically was at home a lot by himself, so he would be out in the streets. That's how he got into selling drugs. Growing up in the streets of West Style was just, it was hard, Joe. I mean, either you were stealing or you was hustling, one of the two, or you was a nobody. I was, you know, a person who was doing a thing on the streets. He used to always see me. He wanted to be somebody, you know what I'm saying? He wanted to be bigger than what he was, so he wanted to be schooled to the game. It's not like he was buying 300 keys and things like that. You know, he was pretty much doing it to get by. He got his little trouble with the law, stuff like that, part of the reason why he couldn't go to school, you know what I'm saying, being away. Got introduced to the drugs, jumped on the drugs, got paid off the drugs, stuff off the drugs. Biggie was arrested one time for selling drugs, so people just twisted it around and took his one time getting busted for drugs as, yo, he's the kingpin. We used to laugh every time we were here, you know what I'm saying, look at an article, you know, gone from drug lord to rap king. Come on, from where? <laughs> How did that happen? What struck me the most about Big in his neighborhood was how much of a, a celebrity he was before he even was out with the record. He was Mr. Know-it-all. He has to be on top of everything. He was the boss as far as his friends. He was the leader. Biggie was the type of person to motivate you. He always wanted you, to, anyone, to succeed. He always wanted everybody to have a better life for themselves. Every time you'd see him, there were all these little kids around him who eventually became Junior Mafia. He always kept a bunch of little guys around him, just like 
keep them company, like just to crack jokes and just chill and bug out. One day, my brother came to me and said, yo, it's this guy who can rap real good, and his name is Big. And I was like, yo, I know Big, you know what I'm saying? He was like, well, he nice, like he the nicest dude in the neighborhood. He can really, really rap. I used to go to like little local parties around the block just to get on the mic and just rap to get us in the club for free. I remember when we first got the Snoop and Dre, the Chronic album. He came over and heard it for the first time in my house and was just, you know, I gotta go home and start writing after he heard that. To Christopher, rapping was just fun. For me, it was noise. So I would tell him, I wish you would stop that noise, <laughs> all that banging and all that talking. And he would say, Ma, it's not noise. One of these days, this noise is gonna make you rich. <laughs> As soon as I put it on, it just blows me out. And his voice just like hypnotized. The transition from selling drugs to the game is like, it's, it's, it's been sharp. Like, you know, I, I mean, I was a hustler and then boom, I was a rapper. He just knew how to rhyme. That was a, a gift God gave him. One day he was like, yo, I'm gonna make a tape and I'm gonna put it out there. I wrote a column on unsigned talent. We put a little ad in the magazine saying, send us your tapes. And at that time, Mr. C submitted Big demo. Big was just outstanding from the beginning. He was riding over a cane beat. He just had a lot of authority to his voice. Something violent about it, but definitely um, very authoritative. During that same time, Puffy had called me trying to find some new groups. As soon as I put it on, it just bowed me out. I couldn't stop listening to it. I listened to it for like days and days, hours and hours. And his voice just like hypnotized me. Puff called Maddie and kept asking him, well, what does he look like? What does he look like? And Maddie was like, nah, you just gotta meet him. You just gotta meet him. I just called all over Brooklyn, went to Brooklyn trying to find him. And I finally found him and had lunch with him. And he was with it. And even when he signed, he still wasn't taking it serious. He was like, I ain't gonna take it serious until it really hit the fan. And then it just snuck right up. Bang, and it was on. He's like, I just want to go go. That's all he used to talk about. I just want to go go. Get some money and get out the hood. He was just hungry. He just wanted to make the album. If he could get 500,000 fans, he used to say, he happy. That's what he used to say. I remember when he got his first gold, he was very, very proud. He, he, he was so excited. He evidently had a party and he came and he says, Ma, look, a little juicy turned gold. He said, I told you. I was gonna make you proud of me. The winner okay. is the Notorious B.I.G. We did it, Brooklyn, we did it! What makes a rapper great is how close he can bring you to his experience. You can just close your eyes and you just right there. You see, some people go write things they seen or heard, but some people go write from the heart on which they loved. And a lot of his stuff, you know what I'm saying? You can see that's what he loved. The gimmick just don't work. If this is real, I'm a rap about this. If I've been through it, I'm a rap about it. His lyrics were incredibly introspective. That's what was so interesting about it. It was like you didn't really hear that before. You didn't hear somebody who really looked inside of himself and just kind of like just splashed it out into his lyrics. He made movies when he rapped. He put things in his songs that painted pictures for you that were just as clear as any movie on any midnight. I was ready to die, a whole concept. Um, just in conversations that he and I had was more along the lines of, it's like, I, I've done so much in my life in terms of the street game that no matter what happens, I'm ready to go if I have to go. I understand that everybody is here for that purpose, you know what I'm saying? So I live to die. I think that he was exploring just the whole idea of, you know, damn, this is rough, this is horrible, you know, I hate my life, I'm just gonna end it, you know, things will be so much better, you know what I mean? But I don't think that he really felt that way. He was a great storyteller. He experienced some of the things, and then he was around people that did those things. He pretty much took their stories and put them on wax.
and it wasn't like that's all he talked about neither. He talked about partying, having a good time, shopping, traveling, going to homecomings, laughing, being with girls. First things first, I pop the freaks, all the honeys, dummies, playboy bunnies, those wanting money. I think Big had a low self-esteem about kind of like the way he looked, but as he started to become successful, and women started liking him, it was exciting to see, man. I mean, I would go over to his house and he was pulling me out like love letters girls had written him. He was like a teddy bear. He was just so coogy and I thought he was really nice. And he had this way about him with women. And Big didn't even finish high school. And it's like, he could have this in-depth conversation with you and have you sitting there like spellbound. He just could kind of just say the right thing, I guess, all the time. If he happened to do something and make you upset, you couldn't stay mad at him, because he just, like, was a funny guy. He made being a big guy sexy. Successful, I think that um, his life changed, and his attitudes about work changed, his attitude about life changed, but those very basic things about him never changed. With his success, it, it never got over his head, or, you know, he never... He was very humble. He was different from and ready to die than life after death to me. He was a little bit more firm, you know what I mean? Because I guess he knew what was out there after that. He just got a little bit more mature and a little bit more business-wise. Ready to die was told from the outside looking in, you know what I mean? And life after death was, was told from the inside looking out. And ready to die, you wanted to achieve that success. And then life after death, it was just that success and coping with that success and dealing with that success. The more money you make, the more problems you get. And jealousy and envy is just something that comes with the territory, man. We kind of talked a lot about how hard it was to be famous, not in that kind of cliched way, like it's, oh, it's so tough having Kristoff flowing all the time. It was about, like, he always felt hassled by people and he wasn't really sure who his friends were, and he kind of felt like he wasn't really safe. He felt appreciated and at the same time, like, condemned, like the pressure of being, you know what I mean, a superstar. He always said, you know something, Mom? There, there, there's so much in this business but he questioned the industry, though. He would say, this business is worse than drugs. And the sad thing about it is, there's enough for everyone. I think that maybe shocked him. Maybe that's his only surprise. He loved Tupac and everybody from the white west that he had known. He loved them. Michael Jackson, but a shadow was cast over the success one night in late 1994, when Tupac Shakur was shot outside the same New York recording studio that Biggie was working in. In a 1995 issue of Vibe magazine, Tupac implicated Biggie and the bad boy camp of setting him up, charges which Big and Puffy would always deny. For the next two years, Biggie found himself in the center of a bi-coastal war of words that would haunt him for the rest of his life. When you get large, even your friends are turning against you, man. The East Coast, West Coast thing was like something that a lot of artists drummed up, a lot of media drummed up, a lot of fans drummed up, everybody all the way around the board. And we just knew it was so stupid that it was going in, but it kept on going on for like one year, two years, and it kept on going on. Even when the Tupac thing was going on, all of the stuff Tupac was saying about him, he, he never wanted to respond to it. Big hated the fact that all of it was going on. He loved Tupac and everybody from the like, West that he had known. He loved them. Every time Pac came to town, he would come around to the neighborhood or Big would go to his hotel. I just remember them drinking lots of Hennessy together and like and playing each other music. They were both really passionate, both incredibly talented, and both were just very real kind of regular brothers. And I think that they, they just sort of both got caught up in the whirlwind of their success. When we first read the article about Tupac and Faith, you know, that whole little thing about him saying that he had been with Faith or whatever. He just started busting out laughing. So I'm like, yo, man, what the hell is wrong with you? He's like, yo, he crazy. He crazy. And that was it. I think somebody was trying to kill me. I'll be waking up paranoid. I'll be really scared. He just knew that 
It was a bad thing when, when he, when Tupac passed, he felt real bad. He knew that there were a lot of people out there that would probably be out there to get him, whether it's they wanted his money or whether if they, you know, just didn't like him because of the rumors. He knew it was people out there who wanted to get him, so he always felt for his safety. He felt, he felt the need for security. He changed the telephone number a lot of times. And um, many people around him thought he was just paranoid. He would wonder how, you know, people get his numbers because he had gotten threatening telephone calls. We were always concerned about our safety. He was always concerned about my safety. And we didn't even say one bad thing about anybody, disrespect anybody. We'd never have anybody robbed or set up a shot at nothing even like that. The difference between Big and Pac is that Pac always predicated everything, like, if I'm alive till I'm 25. Like, he, he was always talking about dying, like he was going to die. And Big never talked like that. Like, Big was talking about being a grandfather and, like, opening up a restaurant or getting back with Faith in 10 years. He wasn't preoccupied with his own death. I found out he was in L.A. and I was very uncomfortable about it because I knew how some people felt about him and the Tupac incident. He was so happy to be in L.A. You know, not just the party, he was like so happy to be out there. Like he was talking about getting a place out there. He finally got his, his album finished. He got sent to us on a CD and he was just happy. He said, you know, I want to go out and celebrate. You know, Quincy Jones invited us to this party and we went in there and we just had a ball. You know what I'm saying? It was like one of the best times we ever had. His spirit was great. And then, you know, a couple of minutes later, it just was all over. The way he died, I know that he it scared him. He didn't deserve that shit at all. Not like that, hell no. No, 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 uh-uh. Too soon, way too soon. We never thought in our wildest dreams that it would ever be like this. Even in the heat of the battle, even being in L.A., you know what I'm saying? We knew the possibilities, but we never thought that. That, that it would come a day where one of us would not be here. You no, know, it's sad, you know what I mean? I was, I was looking at it like, we got a clear mission on our hands, man. It's just catching this money and thinking that we're going to be glorifying the violence that, that gave birth to us. You know what I'm saying? Nana B was, we was birthed out of that violence, and we've seen the results of that violence, man. We need to just leave that violence alone. This record was number one all over the world in memory of one of the greatest rappers, greatest human beings I've ever known, Christopher Wallace. He was a beautiful person, and what he brought to the music business has made a very big difference in where hip-hop is right now. Although it was a short-lived career, but in those few years that he was out as an artist, he made a big difference. The R&B form of hip-hop, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like that's his chamber right there. He's the father of that, you know what I'm saying? From his first hit, Juicy, that took a song like Juicy, which a lot of people wouldn't think about sampling and rhyming over. And he made a, made a smash hit out of it, you know what I mean? He also improved the quality of East Coast music. And I mean, by that, a lot of people that was coming after B.I.G., you had to up your stakes now, you know what I'm saying? You just couldn't come out with anything. You had to get your, get your product better. Everybody loved Big, you know, that's just it. Everybody loved him, he was lovable, you know? Whether you were the hardest dude on the block or, you know, just a little girl wanting to go cop a CD because she liked good music. You know, he made people like rap. You know, and that's the only crime I say that he ever committed was that he made people like rap. Whether you wanted to or not, he made you like it. passes everybody want to say oh he oh he's nice just want to bring the nice things and good things about a person up but it's not even like anyone has to front about that because he was just a generally nice person it's not even just because he's gone that we have to say oh he was a nice person we actually can say we experienced him being nice to us I miss him he was a guy just the sweetest guy he really was unforgettable Truly. I'm just going to miss him. Period. I lost somebody that I love, you know what I'm saying? 
somebody I, I was just in love with. I was just in love with him as a person. That person who killed my son doesn't know my son. They don't know. And that person doesn't know what he or she has really done. Because they really took lives. They might think they, you know, they took a life, but they took lives. They ripped lives apart. I would just love to see that person. I want to look him or her in the face, or look them in the face, because I have to ask them why.